Here is my disclaimer. I'm not a professional body man or a paint man. I owned a repair shop all of my life and did general auto repair. So some people may disagree with the way I've done things, but this is my way and it turned out fine. I tried to explain these videos in very simple terms so everyone can understand it. And like I've said in my videos before, if I can do it at age 71, you certainly can do it. I'm taking this restoration video pretty much in the same way that I did it day by day. So I kind of bounced around and did different things on different days. I hope you enjoy these videos. It's probably more than you'd ever want to know about restoring a Volkswagen. Welcome to the restoration of my 1965 sedan. I'm going to take this day by day as I did it. I did a lot of work before I started restoring this car and uh, later changed my mind and decided to do a full restoration. I found this car near Atlanta, Georgia and my son and I trailered it back to North Carolina. The car looked really good, but not good enough to make a show car out of it. I'm 71 years old, retired professional mechanic, but not a VW mechanic. I'm 71 now, and this will be the last car I'll ever do, and I'll leave it to my son. Back in the 80s, I restored a lot of VWs, a lot of show cars, but it's been so long since I've painted and done body work, it's kind of like learning how to do it all over again. So let's get started by doing the axle boot kit. Here's a little trick using the nut to space your spring plate up to take some of the pressure off that transaxle. This car had worn motor mounts, uh, and that's the reason I used this nut trick to raise the spring plate and the axles up to where I can get the boots in and under it. If you're lucky enough to have a lift, you can do this also to take the pressure off of that tube so you can get your boot in under it. Of course, you can see here just how bad these boots were. Clean this area real good. You don't want any dirt in your transaxle. And here is what's left of the old boot. Here is where the engine number is located. And this is the original engine in this car. The numbers do match. And of course, this is the new boot kit that I'll be using. This shows the boot seam straight up, but really you need to have that seam either at a 10 o'clock or a 2 o'clock position. Here's the transaxle grease plug tool. This is how your boot clamp should go. The clamp will actually pull the two edges of the boot together. This poor quality photo shows the grease fill plug on the left side of the transaxle. The new boot is on, but before I tighten the clamps, I'll turn that boot to either the 2 o'clock or the 10 o'clock position. Now to do some work on the distributor. My distributor had lots of problems. The vacuum advance was bad, what they call the vacuum canister. But not only that, the distributor plate was in such a bind with rust and corrosion that it wouldn't move at all. So I had to take the entire distributor apart, clean it up, lube it. And of course, this is the distributor plate that I've removed and cleaned up. And the inside of the distributor. For points and condenser, you need to go by the serial number on the side of the distributor housing. The arrow shows a thin washer on that distributor shaft. It's greased and ready to go back in. Now the distributor is fixed. Please use a little bit of lube on the cam on that distributor so you don't wear your points out. 
The condenser mounts on the side right next to the vacuum advance. Pull a vacuum on that advance canister to make sure that the plate moves before you put it back in. My grease seals were leaking and this shows a, a photo of the parts on the transaxle. The arrow shows the drain hole that allows uh, grease to go outside if the seal starts to leak. When the grease seal leaks, grease goes through the hole shown by the arrow and drips on the back side of the brake backing plate where you can see it. But that hole is almost always clogged and what that'll do is force the grease onto your brake shoes instead of draining out. The grease seal actually rides on the outside of the part shown here by the yellow arrow. And this photo shows the drain hole right below the axle, as you see here by the red arrow. And these are the parts that come in the seal kit. When you install any kind of a grease seal, always lube it so it won't burn up. I always make a mark with a hacksaw on the opposite side of the pulley where you see the notches so that will aid in uh, valve adjustment. Sure does help to have a press. Here I'm pressing the bearing into the bearing housing. Here's the way I remove that horseshoe clip that holds the uh, emergency brake lever to the shoe. This photo shows the left front axle adjusting nuts and the speedometer cable sticking out of the spindle. And this is a locking tab I made out of a piece of galvanized to lock those two nuts together. There should be a lock between them. And this shows the hole in the speedometer cable where it sticks through the uh, dust cap and a cotter pin goes through it. Well, the seal kit's installed, and you can see at the bottom of the backing plate how much grease has accumulated. Don't try to use a wheel cylinder that is badly pitted. If it can't be cleaned up with a hone, get a new one. This shows that a 1965 VW has ball bearings in the front axle instead of roller bearings like later models used. This front brake drum is ready for the new grease seal now. This is the front inner bearing race. This of course shows the speedometer cable in the left front spindle. It's easy to put these brake adjusters in wrong, so be careful about what you do here. My rear wheel cylinders were pitted way too bad to try to use. I put new ones in it. And here, of course, is the new one. This locking tab on the uh, front axle is kind of crude, but it does the job. It'll lock those two nuts together to keep them from coming loose. Left front brake done and cotter pin through the uh, speedometer cable. This is a throttle cable extender, which I don't like to use. I'd rather get the right cable to start with. This 1965 has two nuts on the clutch cable. The smaller nut is the locking nut, okay? This photo shows the new throttle cable photo taken by the pedal assembly. Two bolts holds this pedal assembly to the tunnel. As you see here, the hook on the clutch cable shaft 
It's just about worn through the hook. It would have broken before long. Another better photo of the same, almost worn through. To take the pedal assembly apart, you have to use a punch to drive the pin out. And this shows the pedal assembly disassembled. I'm not going to use that roller pedal. I'll replace it with a stocker. Now I did weld up this clutch shaft and was going to use it, but then I decided to go ahead and put a new one in it. This out of focus photo shows the front brake hose. This is the part that screws into the wheel cylinder. You don't use a copper seal washer. It just screws directly in and that flare seals it. And here is the uh, brake line itself. The front hose end retaining clip goes into this groove here as shown by the yellow arrow. And that end goes into a bracket on the body pan. There's a motor support right under that nut and they were both shot. Completely separated. Okay, now I'm getting ready to pull that engine since I decided to go ahead and restore the car and rebuild the engine. The original engine coil on this car was leaking oil from the coil itself, so I knew the coil was going south. And I already knew that the uh, vacuum canister on the distributor was bad too. I made a throttle housing out of some ice maker tubing until I find one for it. Always use fuel line clamps on your fuel lines to avoid fires. That's only common sense. And of course where the double arrow is is where your flexible heat duct goes. The two upper engine bolts can be a real pain to get to, especially this one shown that is behind the uh, throwout fork lever. Remove this bolt first while somebody holds the clutch in for you and you can reach it better. Keep your fingers out of the way though, be safe. You'll see a fuel check valve in line with a fuel line right attached to the uh, fuel pump. That was defective on mine, but it isn't really necessary, so I bypassed it. It's great to have a lift to do this, but if you're doing it at home, you're going to have to use some engine stands. Just be sure to have your car high enough on the stands that the engine will clear and roll out from under it, as you see here. I'll start taking this engine apart. I already knew I had a valve problem. Uh, there was no doubt about that. And this is just a photo showing the uh, flywheel clutch and pressure plate. I have always used SACH, S-A-C-H-S, stock disc and pressure plate, brand new. Never have any problems out of them. They're great. The red boxes show the motor support bolts, and yes, the engine has to be out to replace the motor support. And the four yellow arrows are the engine bolts. The top two are bolts and the bottom two are studs that come off the engine. The two small red arrows show the clips that hold the uh, throwout bearing to the throwout arm. You need to watch those clips. I almost lost an eye one time when one flew up and hit my glasses. Glasses saved my eye. Label all your wires with good quality tape so that you'll know where they go when you put all this back together again. The red arrows show the barbs that you need to straighten out that hold your tar boards to the firewall. The yellow arrow shows where the main wiring harness goes through the opening at the top of the firewall on the left. The yellow arrow shows the tabs that hold your tar boards that cover the uh, wiring harness to your taillights. And the red arrow shows one of the engine seals that are, of course, shot in this photo. And here's the rear engine seal, and it's shot as well. These two seals, as you probably know, are absolutely essential to proper engine cooling. And as many know, this is a single port engine, as you can see by the single hole on both heads. 
and these heater box cable connectors need to be replaced. You can buy these in a little kit that contains everything you need. The red rear seal you see here is by far and away the best seal to use. Uh, some of them are black. The camshaft plug is just below the crankshaft as you see here in the photo and I believe it was leaking too. The clutch had been replaced not long ago and this is a satch, both the disc and the pressure plate. The flywheel needed a little cleaning up. Boy did I ever have trouble getting this pulley off. I had some air conditioning tools and that helped, but this didn't work right here, not as you see. It just wouldn't come loose with this tool and I didn't want to bend that uh, pulley so I stopped and tried another method. Normally this tool pulls this right off. Top view of the engine showing the uh, single port heads. And you can see I've removed the distributor and the fuel pump. Now this method to re remove the pulley finally worked. I use a steering wheel puller as shown here. And this is the back side of the uh, pulley using the steering wheel puller. And this method did pull it off with no damage. This shows the bottom of the oil cooler and the oil cooler seals and the oil cooler was not leaking. Do you notice anything wrong in this photo? Actually, there's two things wrong in this photo. First, you don't use bolts to hold this rocker arm stand on. There should be studs. Then you can tell by looking at number three exhaust valve that the exhaust valve has receded into the head, so that engine's going to have to come apart. I'm learning as I go with this 1200 engine. I'd never built a 1200 engine before, so there were some things I needed to know. Notice how the holes in the area in the head around the uh, rocker arm stand studs. Notice how that's round? Well, the later better heads for 1200 are what they call the square boss heads. And I replaced both heads to the square boss heads, and you'll see that later on in the, in the videos. The 1200 engine uses copper sealing rings around the top of the jugs that seal the head to the jug. Later models don't use that. Now these jugs, while old, were still in good shape, so I'm going to hone them, and if the pistons check out okay, I'll just hone it and put new rings in it. And the jug on number three has been removed. You just pull it right off. Now you can see in this photo how the number three exhaust valve is a little higher than the rest of them, where that valve had receded. Use a pair of needle nose to pull these little clips out of the pistons that retain the wrist pin. Now's the time to check the wrist pin bushings. You can uh, see if there's any wobble in that piston where it connects to the rod. If there is, you'll have to have wrist pin bushings. Just a photo of the block showing where the oil field stand bolts and there's a baffle there under that stand as well. This shows when the timing mark is at top dead center, how number one connecting rod is all the way out at top dead center. And the engine oil field stand cap, vent tube, and you can see the little baffle down to the right lower. Use a large screwdriver to pry your engine oil seal out of the case. This large nut that retains the flywheel is called the gland nut. Always replace that. I have seen cheap versions snap off. Inside that gland nut are roller bearings where the transaxle input shaft goes. The engine pulley has to be off in order to get to these two screws that hold the sheet metal on. You check a piston ring gap by putting the ring in the cylinder in the jug and squaring that up with the top of a piston to make sure that it's square with the cylinder. You can measure that end gap with a feeler gauge and adjust as necessary by using a file. Spread that ring and just put a file between it and file it down to what you need. And this, as I mentioned before, is the camshaft oil seal plug that has to go in as you put the case together. I believe this one was leaking. 
Now you can see inside this engine, you see the yellow arrow shows that camshaft end plug. Notice that there are no cam bearings in this engine. The camshaft wears directly against the engine case in the early 1200s. The later 1200s did have cam bearings. And that is bad news to me because I had to send this case off to California to have it machined for cam bearings. This shows how your cam gear in relation to the crankshaft gear, your timing marks, you don't want to ever get this wrong or you'll have to pull your engine apart again. You want to get your engine case as clean as possible and I use some gun brushes, gun cleaning brushes to clean out all the oil passages too. This shows the main bearing that goes at the flywheel end of the crankshaft and the adjusting shims that you use to set up the crankshaft end play. The distributor shaft has shims to set up the end play in it too, the clearance in it, and you need to do that while a case is apart so you can make sure that that's perfect. This is my tool to remove valve springs and it'll work on just about anything, any engine. This shows how your crankshaft assembly should go. Your gears, your distributor gear, your cam gear, snap rings, the little oil shield slinger. The oil slinger is the large flat washer you see here. From bottom to top, the red arrow shows a keyway. The next is the oil slinger, the main bearing, the snap ring that retains the two gears, the distributor gear, the spacer, the camshaft gear, and then a bearing. Be sure to have your dowel pins, your dowel pin holes in the bearings in the right direction when you put this crankshaft together so you don't have to do it again. Bad news here, both the front windows and both vent windows have bad scratches in them. I'm going to have to either get new or find better. Never make this mistake. This is what happens when you don't use plastic between your door and your door panel to keep the water out. It'll rot your panels and they'll start warping. These window regulators were not in real bad shape. I just had to clean them up in the parts washer and re-grease that spiral drive spring. On later model bug regulators, I have taken that spiral drive spring completely out. Just starting to take this car apart, stripping the interior and stripping the trunk. And here I've removed all the door parts, the regulator, and door latch, and everything inside. Sometimes an impact screwdriver will work when nothing else will when you take the doors off. Those screws can be extremely tight. And here's a photo of the crankshaft assembly that might help you some. And here's the bare case, just put together, no internals. I had to remove these studs because I had to ship this case off to California for cam bearings. Shown here is a tool to help remove studs, but if you don't have that, you can always double nut a stud as shown here to back that stud out. And here I'm using a cylinder hone to hone the cylinders. They're all in good shape. They just need to be honed to a good crosshatch. As shown here, and after honing, wash it real good with soap and water. Dry it thoroughly. Use a protectant like WD-40 or oil. I mark my cylinders the way they go, one, two, three, and four, by making small grinding marks at the very bottom of the jug, as you see here and a better view here. I'm taking my car apart, but I have my son's 70 show car in here. We're doing some work on it as well. Well, I'm sending the engine block off to Remco in California to have it machined for cam bearings. The insurance and the machining and the shipping was very expensive. My bug had pop-out windows in the rear, 
and this is the pop-out window assembly, and it bolts to the already drilled holes where the quarter window goes. You can see them here on this ridge 